Well, I, we're so near spring, I decided I'd break out the yellow tie this morning. I'm, I'm feeling it, although it's kind of funny. Uh, I, I, I told Jane Lee, we were debating. I, I get my math turned around sometime. I said, you know, if people made a mistake and, and uh, ran their clocks the wrong direction, she'd say, well, anyway, they'd be two hours off track, right? I, who knows? Anyway, we'll see if everybody gets here second service. We're glad you're here up and up and going. If you do not have one of the bulletin inserts, would you raise your hand? We've got some people that will try to help. Okay, guys in the back, uh, if you've got some of those bulletin inserts, if you don't mind helping us. I can't see who's in the foyer back there. Gary, do we have some extra ones back there? They should be coming out in just a minute, and uh, we want you to, to have those, and so I'll, I'll try to remind you to raise your hand. Also, uh, thanks to, to Gary for helping us with these outlines. Gary and Wanda, I think that's been a good addition for us. Also, John is helping us with something uh, that I think is really neat. Those of you that enjoy using smartphones or tablets, and a number of you do, uh, you can now access what's on these printed hard copies online. You can either go to Uversion, if you have Uversion on your phone, and go to the live events and then scroll down. I think about the third one down has Rural Hill and it has today's sermon topic on it. Uh, you're already in. Duke is into this big time. Uh, but you can also go to our church website. Org. Let me move over here. We've got a crazy spot there. Uh, ruralhill.org and uh, look under sermon inserts, a tab at the top, and you can get to it that way as well. So if you enjoy using your technology, uh, that's just one more wonderful way that we have of, of doing that this morning. And thanks, John, for getting that set up for us. The sixth commandment is the shortest of the ten. In English, it's only four words. You shall not murder. In the Hebrew, it's only two words. No murder. It's probably the most universally accepted of all the commandments among both non-Christians as well as Christians. Because I think instinctively God has created human beings to know that human life is valuable. And even in the most undeveloped, uneducated, uncivilized cultures of the world, people seem to know that murder is simply not acceptable. And yet hardly a day goes by in our world that we don't hear about someone or even groups of people being murdered. The most recent statistics that I could come up with in the United States for murder were, was 2013. And in 2013, there were almost 15,000 murders in the United States alone. That doesn't count the tens of thousands of people around the rest of the world who were murdered in 2013. And then when you think about the more than one million abortions that take place in America alone on an annual basis, we're talking about the loss of a lot of life. And lest we think that murder is a recent problem, we only need to be reminded that the very first funeral on the planet was not for an old person who lived a long and fruitful life. Rather, the very first funeral on the planet was for a young man who was murdered by his brother. Now, instinctively, we know that murder is wrong, but why is it that God says that murder is so wrong? Well, certainly it's wrong because of the pain and the agony and the disruption and the loss that it creates for the family and friends of the murdered victim. But murder is also fundamentally wrong to God for at least two reasons that I can think of. Number one, our sovereign God is the creator of all life. He's certainly the creator of human life. Our life is not our own, not totally. Our life, your life, belongs to the one who made you, who created you. And so God alone has the right to decide when a person dies. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, Man is destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. 
And so God is the judge, and He alone has the right to decide when our appointment with death is going to come. I don't have that right, and you don't have that right. The second reason why God says murder is fundamentally wrong is because human life is sacred. In Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, when Noah and his family were coming off the ark, God gave them instructions about how they were to live in this new world that was existing for them after the flood. And God explained to them that for the very first time, mankind would be allowed to kill animals and have animals to eat. But God also told them that in eating these animals, they must drain the blood out of it. You must not eat the life blood. It's referred to in Scripture. And then God said this in verses 5 and 6 in Genesis chapter 9. For your life blood, I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from each man for the life of his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made him. Now, the key word there, the reason why we're not to murder is because human beings are created in God's image. We have permission to take life from animals and from plants. We have permission from God to take life from everything he's created if we need to, except for the life of human beings. And when we murder a person, a person who is made in God's very image, then we attack God himself. Well, in the Hebrew language, that language is very interesting. There are three different words that get translated into English as kill. Two of them are used fairly commonly, but there's one word, one of those three, that's not used very often, and it's that third usage that's found here in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. It's a word that implies a violent killing of a personal enemy. Now, I checked 12 different translations, as well as looking at some commentators, but I wanted to see how the various translators had translated this word that we find in Genesis 20, verse 13. Nine of the 12 translations translated the word as murder. Three of the translations translated it as kill. And those three translations are very reputable, very sound and solid translations. Those are the King James Version, the American Standard Version, and the Revised Standard Version. But interestingly enough, when each one of those versions went through the revision process, in other words, now we have the new King James, the new American Standard, and the new Revised Version, all three of those versions revised the translation, and in those, the word now is not kill, but murder. And so the translators, as well as the commentators, are almost unanimous in saying the best translation of that word in this commandment is the word murder. Now, why is it important to make the distinction between the word kill and the word murder? Well, it's because not all killing is murder. All murder is killing, but not all killing is murder. Let me illustrate that. In the law of Moses, Moses gives five different types of killing to help us distinguish. For instance, and you, as you're filling out your blanks there, the first one that's mentioned is what we call premeditated murder. That's talked about in Numbers chapter 35, verses 20 and 21, which say, If anyone with malice aforethought shoves another or throws something at him intentionally, so that he dies, or if in hostility he hits him with his fist so that he dies, that person shall be put to death. He is guilty of murder. Now, the key here is that the aggressor actually thinks about it in advance. The aggressor wants to do harm to another individual. And because of his anger or her hatred, the aggressor plans to do violence to another person. 
And when death results from that, God says that's called premeditated murder. Is premeditated murder an unpardonable sin? What do you think? No, it's not. Because those who murdered Jesus, who crucified him, when they repented of that sin and obeyed Jesus, they were forgiven of that sin. When Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, knew that he had been persecuting, even overseeing the death of Christians, repented of his sin, the Apostle Paul was forgiven of that murder. So it's not the unforgivable sin, but the Apostle John says to this, unrepentant murderers will have their place in the lake of burning sulfur in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. The second distinction that Moses makes in the law is what was called accidental homicide. And that's also described in Numbers chapter 35. If a person kills somebody else without hostility, if there was no intent to harm another person, in other words, if it was simply an accident, then there's no violation of the sixth commandment. That's very clear in Numbers 35. The third distinction is something called justifiable homicide. And it occurs when a person takes another life in self-defense. Exodus chapter 22, verse 2 says this. If a thief is caught breaking in and is struck so that he dies, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. Now, this exception to the law of not taking life certainly applies to our police and to those who are public uh, security forces who literally risk their own lives to protect us against people who would do us harm and people who would want to kill us. God says that we're not to be life stealers, but he does permit us to be life defenders. And then there's the fourth, killing in war. That was not condemned under the law of Moses. Now, certainly there are honest Christians and scholars who are far smarter than I am who would disagree with me on this particular point. Their understanding of the Bible, and certainly when you take into account the New Testament's teachings, would lead them to conclude that a Christian has to be a pacifist. But the Bible's very clear, certainly in the Old Testament, that the same God who told the Israelites not to murder also sent them into war very often, where thousands of lives were lost. In the New Testament, for instance, soldiers approached John the Baptist. John was teaching them, but John did not tell these soldiers to resign their commissions in the military in order to follow Christ. Later, when Peter was preaching to a Roman centurion, named Cornelius, and baptized Cornelius and his whole household. Nothing is said in that text about Cornelius being commanded to give up his position in the army. And then there's a fifth. Capital punishment is another exception to the command not to kill. When someone was guilty of premeditated murder under God, under his law, God said that you were to execute that individual. Exodus chapter 21, verse 12 says, Anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. But it's interesting in the Old Testament that there were other offenses, not just people who were guilty of murder, but there were other offenses for which God said capital punishment is appropriate. One of those passages is in Deuteronomy chapter 13, where he says, person who tries to lead my people away into idolatry is to be executed. And so the law of Moses makes it very clear that not all killing is murder. Until Jesus was crucified on this last point about capital punishment, I find again two examples to be enlightening. When Jesus was crucified, he was still living under the old covenant. When he was brought before Pilate and the Roman officials, Jesus denied the charges that were brought against him, but Jesus did not deny the right and the authority of the Roman government to execute people. Paul 
who lived under both dispensations, the Old Covenant and under the New Covenant of Jesus Christ, believed exactly the same thing as Jesus. As a Christian, Paul denied the charges that were brought against him. But in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, Paul says that God has given authority to governments to judge people and to punish people and even to use the sword against the offender. In other words, to execute people. Now, you may be saying to yourself, we've looked at five of the commands already. We're now in the sixth. And kind of go, I don't have to worry about this one. Because I've never murdered anybody, and I'm not likely to murder anybody, so this is one I don't have to be terribly concerned about. Don't be so quick. Don't be so fast. Because murder not only is an act, murder is also an attitude. It's true that most of us will never murder anyone, but have you ever been so angry with somebody that you would like to hurt them? (laughs) I think we can all say that we'd like to hurt them. I'm not sure we're so angry we'd like to kill somebody, although some of us may have been so angry that we would like to. Or if not, we wouldn't mind seeing somebody else do it for us. We wouldn't mind seeing one of our enemies die because our bitterness and hatred toward them is so strong. See, just because you're not likely to actually murder someone does not mean that you are innocent of breaking the sixth command. Listen to these words of Jesus. Listen very carefully to these words of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, verses 21 and 22, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. Now, what did Jesus just do? He quoted the sixth commandment. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Those are strong words from Jesus. Those are frightening words from Jesus. Because what Jesus does is, He goes to the motive. He goes straight to the heart, to our human heart. Because Jesus knew that sometimes we have the capability of becoming so angry at another person that we would hurt them if we could. Or again, even if we personally wouldn't take action against somebody else, we wouldn't mind seeing somebody else hurt the person that we're so angry at. But our Lord tells us that being so angry that we treat another person, even with contempt, makes us subject to judgment. That word raka in the text we just read, R-A-C-A, is an interesting word. It's a derogatory Aramaic word that Jews in Jesus' day used when they wanted to insult another person. The root word from which raka comes is a word that means to spit. Have you ever seen somebody so angry they just spit? See, that's that's the that's the thought here that Jesus is getting at. It it was an offensive name used to show utter contempt for another person. It's a it's to say raka in Jesus' day. That's not a word in our vocabulary. Never heard anybody look at somebody else and say rock. But our translation in the year 2015, are we? Yeah, we're in 15. Our translation might be something like this I hate your guts. I wouldn't give you the time of day. I wouldn't walk across the street to shake your hand. You are an empty headed, meaningless person to me. You have no value. You have no importance. There's nothing about you that gives you any meaning in my life. I have a confession to make to you this morning. 
Studying this particular passage hit me hard this week. I've never murdered anybody. I don't intend to murder anybody. I, I doubt I ever will. But I have been guilty. And I am guilty. Of viewing some people with such utter contempt and disdain and disgust that for all practical purposes, I have regarded them as having absolutely no value, no worth, no importance in my life. If they just disappeared off the planet, it would be just fine with me. Have any of you ever felt the same way? And I just had to say to God, God, I'm sorry. I've read this passage before, but I don't think it's ever hit me this hard because I'm not sure that in, I'm not sure I've ever really faced up to the fact that there are a few people in my life, a few people that I just it's not this just that I don't like them. I just have a feeling of total and utter disregard. And Jesus says to us in Scripture, you treat a person that way, you harbor that kind of anger, that kind of resentment, that kind of bitterness in your heart toward another person. You are not only guilty of being in judgment, but if you go so far as to say to them, and I don't think you even have to literally say the words, but to even think the words, you fool, you're guilty of the fires of hell. You see how frightening that is? Because what Jesus says is you don't have to literally go out and kill somebody. You can hate somebody. You can despise somebody to the point that you, in essence, have murdered them. You better get your heart right. And for those people that I have felt kind of disregard for, what I have got to do is get on my knees and say, God, I don't want to pray for this person, but you told me to pray for this person. And I have a hunch, if I begin to pray for the people that I have such disdain for, my heart will change. What do you think? And that's exactly what Jesus is saying to us. I'm absolutely convinced of that. See, let me explain to us how we can be guilty of Killing someone even though we're not guilty of literally murdering them. One is to hate them. John says this, 1 John 3, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother, what goes in the blank next, is a murderer. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. There's a second way that I think we can be guilty of breaking the sixth commandment without literally killing somebody. And that is being indifferent to them. Again, it's just another way of treating another person as being unimportant. Indifference leads us not to help others when they need our help. See, being a godly person is more than simply not killing somebody else. Being a godly person also means that we actively do something good to benefit others. And to make their lives better. Martin Niemuller was a German Lutheran pastor who lived in the 1930s. And although he was anti-Nazi, he was not strongly anti-Nazi during much of his ministry when Hitler and the Nazi regime was rising. He didn't take a really strong stand against Hitler's regime while the Nazis were killing, murdering six million Jews. Finally, 
Niemöller himself was arrested by the Nazis and put in one of Hitler's brutal concentration camps. He survived that, and years later, this is what Niemöller wrote. In Germany, they came for the communist. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. And then they came for me. And by that time, there was nobody left to speak up. Niebuhler learned too late that indifference kills, literally. Jesus talked about the sin of indifference in Matthew chapter 25. Then he said to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. Then also, they also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not to one of the least of these, you did not do to me. That's the sin of indifference. Paul writes these same thoughts in a more positive way in Romans chapter 13. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, Love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, I'm likely to read that verse again in some of the upcoming lessons in the rest of the Ten Commandments. Love is the fulfillment of all those laws. Love is the answer to defeat anger and hate. Love is the answer that enables us to keep the Sixth Commandment. It's being so full of the love of God in us, in our own hearts, that we don't have room to hate another person, nor do we have any desire to hurt another person. And typically that's not the kind of love that we're able to gin up from within our own strength. It's God's love at work in us when we remind ourselves over and over that God loves us in spite of our weakness and sin and failure. And that He has forgiven us through Jesus Christ, even though we didn't deserve it. And knowing that gives us the motivation to love others as God has loved us. If you and I are full of God's love, then we won't murder anybody. But if we are full of God's love, then we won't hurt other people. And if we're full of God's love, we will try to love them as God has loved us. Here's the conclusion. The sixth command is stated in a negative way. In Hebrew, literally, it's no murder. But I think if we try to turn that around and, and state it positively, the most positive two words that I can think of that capture the thought of the sixth commandment are protect life. Protect life. Now, very, very quickly. Well, this will be fun in the groups tonight, Gary. Hopefully people will discuss this. What are practical, everyday, nitty-gritty ways that we can actually Promote and protect life, you individually and us as a group. Well, the things I'm going to mention to you quickly certainly deserve a lot more attention. And these are by no means an exclusive list, an exhaustive list of all the things. But given the fact that we have so little time, let me just tease your mind a little bit with some positive ways that we can actually fulfill the Sixth Commandment. One is we can help the homeless. One of the ways we do that, for instance, is through Room in the Inn. There are a lot of other ways. You see, we're protecting life, promoting life, making life better for people. 
We can help victims of domestic, domestic abuse and violence, both women and children. We can help organizations and ministries that work with women who have unplanned pregnancies. Or agencies like Agape, for instance. We can provide foster care, even adoptions for children whose mothers decide to give them birth rather than abort them. Listen, folks. If Christians are going to be against abortion, then we'd better be ready to help those children whose mothers decide to give them birth. Does that make sense? We can provide support groups for people dealing with grief and divorce and depression and addictive behaviors like drug and alcohol addiction. We can volunteer at food banks like Southern or Second Harvest or soup kitchens or disaster relief. Or we can donate to those. See, those are just a few examples of ways that we can positively protect and promote and better life for people rather than take it away from them. Whenever we have the opportunity to do those things, I believe in a very positive way we're keeping the Sixth Commandment. It occurred to me as we were talking about death and murder. There's one murder that took place centuries ago that has benefited us, right? There were people who murdered Jesus Christ. You know, God, God's plan, sometimes his ways are so much higher than ours. Uh, why his son had to be murdered, killed the way that he was, still is bigger and deeper than most of us will ever understand. But because Jesus died and took our sins upon himself, you and I have the opportunity and the privilege of having our sins forgiven. And we have the opportunity to live with the Lord forever because of his death. The way you contact that death for yourself personally is through baptism. And then through an obedient life as you walk with him from now until he comes again. This morning, if you need to respond in any way, we invite you to come right now. Let's stand. Let's sing.